I was drafted in the army after I got out of college in, um, uh, in May of, I graduated May of 69 by the following March, I was in the army. And by the following November, I was in Vietnam. So um, <laughs> talk about a crazy transition. And if you can remember anything about that time, Justin, the world was out of control, uh, much like it is today. 50 years ago, maybe 50 years plus, but uh, we're back at ground zero. And I think in ways that are even more um, concerning and confounding than they were back then, because we had, even though it wasn't totally, totally on our side, we had a Congress and a government that sort of was functional. We had, um, we had people who seemed to be trying to keep guys like me from going to Vietnam um, in peaceful ways. And um, it, it, there seemed to be at least enough people listening to reason and rationality and not using other devices like social media to slam uh, and harass and hurt people. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little dicier now, if you ask me, and maybe that's part of my age. But um, when I look back and I think about it, and I think about Kent State in particular, the, the piece that I'm going to read, um, and that was inspired not it's a little bit by what's going wrong today, but also by the fact that I had been invited to go to Kent State 10 years ago for the 40th anniversary. Um, and it just summoned up all these kinds of uh, feelings and reactions and observations that when I started to write it now, I mean, I, I didn't write about it then. I went and I participated. And then uh, there was a chance we were going to be asked back for the 50th, and that got canceled. Um, I sort of sat down and took stock of America now, America then, and America when I was going through this whole thing and, and was around for Kent State. And that's what sort of prompted uh, my writing this piece that I called uh, Return to the Scene of the Crime. Black Panther co-founder Bobby Seale was there. So was the late great Congressman John Lewis. And filmmaker Michael Moore, Country Joe McDonald too, and me, I was there. I'm talking about the 40th anniversary of the shootings at Kent State University, which took place on May 4th, 2010. The intended 50th anniversary this year like most public events that were scheduled in the spring, was canceled. And that makes me wonder if the 40th anniversary 10 years ago when I was there might be the last hand-wringing occasion for members of my generation so deeply impacted by what happened at Kent State on May 4th, 1970. That would be our last chance to gather in that space around that moment. There remains too much pain and confusion and blame and misunderstanding accompanies the Kent State shootings. All these years later, it's still present. You can feel it in the air on that large, sprawling campus in Kent, Ohio. On May 4th, 2010, I was at Kent State as part of a panel sponsored by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Our topic was, next stop is Vietnam, the war on record, to accompany the release Bear Family Records compilation of the same name a pristine box set that includes 13 CDs and a 304 page coffee table book. My partner, Craig Werner and I co-authored a long essay for the book, which was a scaled down version of what would eventually become, We Gotta Get Out of This Place, the soundtrack of the Vietnam War, our award winning. My fellow panelists that day were Hugo Kiesing, who was the archivist for the Bear Family Collection, and Old country Joe McDonald, the uh, musician um, who'd written the foreword to that book next to, to that coffee table book, Next Up is Vietnam, but also had penned one of the Vietnam anthems, I Feel Like I'm Fixing to Die Rag. Our moderator was Lauren Anke, then director of education for the Rock Hall, who's now the director of music for National Public Radio. Lauren and I drove together to Kent from Cleveland, Ohio, where I flew in, and we met at the Rock Hall and drove to Kent. We quickly got acquainted, personal and musical connections laying the groundwork, but I don't think either of us was prepared for what Kent State would be like that day. I remember asking at one point as we were driving down, how do you celebrate a tragedy? But I don't think we labored on that question very long and no sooner 
then 11 o'clock arrived and we were on campus. It was already packed with Kent State students, media, alumni, and a bunch of people from my generation, baby boomers. What we didn't know by arriving then was that a lot of the crowd was already waist deep in the big muddy, as Pete Seeger would say, as a result of several intense days of music, films, and speeches, including a truth tribunal that was led by Laurel Krauss, the sister of Allison Krauss, one of the four young people that was killed on May 4th, 1970, when 28 National Guardsmen fired nearly 70 rounds in 13 seconds, killing four and wounding nine. According to Ms. Krauss, the Kent State Truth Tribunal was formed to, quote, establish a clear and correct historical record to help heal the personal and collective wounds from this atrocity. Words like atrocity hung in the air that sunny afternoon. At high noon, all classes were recessed and the official commemoration began on the Kent State Commons. Many of the event's conveners were spirited undergrad Kent State females who spoke eloquently of why Kent State mattered to them today in 1970 and from 1970 to 2010. At 1224 p.m., the time of the 1970 shootings, the victory bell was rung 13 times, four for the students who were killed and nine for those who were wounded. Next, an assortment of eyewitnesses, family members of the deceased, and activists spoke. Sandy Schuer, stuck in the neck by an Ohio National Guardman's bullet, was a girl with, quote, a bubbly personality who was always doing things for others, said a note from a friend that was preserved in a scrapbook kept by her sorority. Think about her every day, the Kent State chapter's current president, Sarah Franciosa said, irony of ironies, Sandy Schur's mother had passed away that very morning. Jeffrey Miller was remembered as a drummer and a radio DJ whose five foot six stature earned him the, the on-air name of Short Mort, recalled his, other brother, his older brother, Russ. On the night of the shootings, still unaware that his brother had been killed, Russ watched news reports about Kent State with his grandmother in the Bronx. She asked him if Jeff would have been at the rally. No doubt, Russ Miller told her, knowing his brother's strong feelings against the war. But I wasn't concerned because I knew he would keep his head down, Russ said. No, he didn't. Jeff Miller died, his brother reminded us, shot in the mouth. How painful could this get? Just wait. 90 year old Florence Schroeder, mother of Scott Schroeder, used a walker to make her way to the stage. On May 4th, 1970, I was 50 years old with brown hair and good legs, she laughed. Today, I'm 90 and can no longer pitch batting practice. Her son was an Eagle Scout and a member of ROTC, an honor student who was walking to class when he was shot in the back with a rifle more than a football field's length away. The death of a child is very hard, but life goes on, she said. Then she read the last line of a poem her son had written. Learning from the past is a prime consideration. I pray we have all learned that lesson, she added. Allison Krause's Kent State boyfriend, Barry Levine, spoke of a sweet, intelligent, loving, warm, intelligent, compassionate, creative, funny, giving, intelligent woman. She sat on the hill where you now sit, he told the audience. She walked on those paths where you now stand. Her laughter used to dance through the branches of these trees. Allison Krauss was shot in the side as Levine pulled her behind a car for shelter from the gunfire. She fell mortally wounded in his arms. Levine had rarely spoken publicly about the events of that day, and it soon became obvious that his anger and outrage had been building for 40 years. Riffing on Bob Dylan's song, Who Killed Davy Moore? Levine made an impassioned, at times irate, appeal for justice for the shootings. Lauren and I were reeling, and we'd only been here for less than two hours. We caught up with Country Joe, who himself seemed woozy from a pushback he'd received from a bunch of Vietnam vets during a film screening the night before. How in the hell were we going to get through our presentation tonight, given how raw and hurt everyone seemed? Following the commemoration, we attended a reception in the student center, which was about as bizarre 
as any I've ever intended. To this point in my life, my experience with anniversaries had been upbeat, upbeat and celebratory. And while this had a hint of that, people embracing and rejoicing at seeing one another, it was downright macabre as folks like Alan Canfora, shot in the right wrist, and Thomas Grace, wounded in the left ankle, compared their May 1970 wounds. And then Dean Kaler, who was shot in the back and paralyzed that day, rolled up in his wheelchair and reminded his former Kent State classmates that the first letter he'd opened after he came out of a coma on Friday, May 8th, 1970, had these words, Dear Communist Hippie Radical, I hope by the time you read this, you are dead. I hadn't just lost my breath, I'd lost my bearings. So much resentment, so much pain, and it seemed as if nothing had changed in 40 years. I did not want to be a part of the closing event for the commemoration. I wanted to get as far away from Kent State as I could. And then I remembered my own experience of graduating from US Army basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey, just two days after President Nixon had ordered the invasion of Cambodia, and my worrying that as a soldier, I would be summoned to a college campus to aim a rifle at my fellow countrymen. It was a real fear, a legitimate possibility, like today's, but it never happened. Vietnam did, and strangely, there was more talk of the My Lai Massacre, the Pentagon Papers, and none of us being the last GI killed in Vietnam during my tour in 1970 and 1971 than there was at Kent State. Maybe we were because we were all living with the same dread. Hugo, Joe, and I made our presentation at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, May 4th, 2010, to a large, engaged, and heavily veteran audience. Even the battle-weary country Joe rose to the occasion as we gave the absorbed audience a sense of how vital music was to the men and women who served in Vietnam and the folks who stayed home. And after they came home, what it meant to the vets to get back. Hugo and I played excerpts from a number of those memorable songs. These boots are made for walking, Fortunate Son, Detroit City, Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, and more while Joe strummed a few bars of his favorite song, I Feel Like I'm Fixing to Die Rag. The response was heartwarming. One of the vets who came up to me later, a Vietnam vet against the war insignia on his old flak jacket, thanked me and said, hey, I'm glad you didn't play Ohio. We couldn't have handled that tonight. All I knew then, and what I felt that day 50 years ago, and what I feel strongly today in the throes of this COVID, con pan the COVID pandemic, racial unrest, police in the streets, is that language matters, words matter, and they can wound as much as bullets. The rhetoric of Nixon and his Vice President Spiro Agnew and Ohio Governor Rhodes and others calling the students at Kent State and even some of us who were overseas in Vietnam, bums, the worst element in our society, worse than the communists, the night riders, and the vigilantes, and calling us vets crybabies after we came home from the war and tried to stop it. The hate speech at that time is the vitriolic hate speech of today. Those words do have consequences. Just ask the students at Kent State. And I wonder, Ponder John Fogarty of Creedence Clearwater Revival. Still, I wonder who'll stop the rain. <laughs>